Pause. Silence. Let's reconvene in person again to reconnect, to tell our stories, to listen, to disarm ourselves of preconceived notions, to reframe, to reflect, to unplug. Welcome to Hashtag Unplugged 22. Take a victory lap. High five a friend. This is your moment, our moment. Together, we unplug to connect again and remember why we started. Let's evaluate our community and our digital impact as quality conversations rooted in context. We are about real connections that translate into real life action. Brought to you by Jam Lab Africa and the Civic Tech Innovation Network. Excellent. Well, welcome everyone. Um, <clears throat> apologies, I'm. I have a little bit. Um, I was like cold, but hello and well, a very warm welcome to Janfest 2022. It's a premier event organized by the Journalism and Media Lab, otherwise known as Jam Lab Africa, which is a project of Vitz Center for Journalism in Johannesburg, South Africa. Janfest for 2012 is co-hosted along the Civic Tech Innovation Forum. And we thank you for joining us from across the continent and, uh, and from the rest of the world for this year's festival under the hashtag Unplugged. My name is Emmanuel Agbeko Gamon. I previously worked as a global programs manager with Meta, or fa formerly Facebook, um, and I currently teach a digital course with USB as a commit. I'm looking forward to facilitating this session, which is titled Exploring New Stories Inside the Metaverse. Our hope is that you will leave this knowledge um, session with a better understanding of narratives shaping the metaverse, uh, but also exploring what are the new stories and the art of storytelling within the metaverse. Uh, we have a phenomenal panel to help us unpack this. Um, we'll go into a couple of housekeeping rules and then I'll introduce or mention a few blurbs about those on the panel um, and then we should go into their presentations as well. Um, if you can, please share and tweet about today's conversation on social media using the hashtag Jamfest 2022, one word, and Unplugged 22. We would like for this discussion to be interactive. Um, please use the Q&A function for any questions at our speakers, um, as well as your comments and queries. Um, kindly be aware that the note on this session is also being recorded and will be publicly available on our various digital and different platforms. Uh, today's session, we have some amazing panelists. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Tulana Bola, Bohila, and Tulana is a journalist and co-founder of Owner Stories, an African-first graphic journalism hub at Aga Khan Media Innovator. Um, she heads Owner Stories Immersive Unit that pioneers the use of virtual and augmented reality in Tanzania. Uh, she directed Tanzania's first augmented reality gallery for Vodacom in 2019. Tulanana was a co-producer of Ghosts of the Present, East Africa's first collaborative Swahili virtual reality film in 2021. She held Tanzania's first VR showcase at HDIF Innovation Week in 2018, supported by Kenyan VR production house, Black Rhino. Her first 360 piece, What Could You Do? A reflection piece on sexual harassment and public transport has been showcased at the Sheffield International Documentary Festival. Her previous roles <clears throat> include senior broadcast journalist and producer at BBC World Service. A lot of her work focuses on how mobile emerging technology is changing the way content is created and shared on the African content, continent featured on prestigious TEDx platform via TEDx and platform. Up next is Princely Glorious. Princely is an entrepreneur, speaker and writer with a focus on creative industries, mental models and communication strategy. He is the co-founder of the Ona Stories Group, Tanzania's first XR uh, <clears throat> and technology and storytelling company. Over the past 11 years, Princely has led strategy, communications, and design for multi-million private sector players and leading international development organizations. He can help you clarify your strategy and find your story to win hearts, change minds, or do both. At Ona Stories, he established the Creator Network, a collective of over 250 creative professionals who get access to upscaling training and jobs in their fields. 
from managing national campaigns, promoting innovation, innovative and nutrition approaches that help rural mothers give their children the best start to life, to directing Tanzania's first augmented reality audiovisual gallery for Vodacom. Princely helps organizations find and tell impactful stories. Kunle Adebaje is also joining us, and he's an investigations editor at Hum Angle, a media establishment that focuses on reporting conflict, development, and humanitarian trends in Africa. He was formerly with the International <clears throat> Center for Investigations Reporting as an investigative reporter. He's a 2019 fellow of Africa Czech, 2020 fellow of Dubawa, and an alumnus of British Council's Future News Worldwide program. He is passionate about human rights and accountability, as well as how human-centered storytelling can help bring attention to these issues. Kunle has won a number of journalism awards, including the 2021 Wally Sayinka Award for Investigative Journalism, 2019 West African Media Excellence Award for Best Telecommunications Report, and 2020 Diamond Media Award for Education Reporting. He was a 2020 finalist for the Isu Ilahile Awards on Child-Centered Reporting, and a top entrant for the 2020 PwC Media Excellence Award. Last but not least is Laura Hertzfeld. Laura is an Emmy-winning writer, editor, and producer with over a decade of experience in news and entertainment, helping media brands develop their online content, engagement, and distribution strategies. Most recently, she was director of the XR Partner Program at Yahoo RYOT Studio, formerly for Rising Media Group. She's a mentor for the current cohort of the New Inc. artists at the New Museum in New York City. As a 2019 John S. Knight Journalism Fellow at Stanford University, Laura completed research on the intersection of art, immersive technology, and journalism. This work built off her role as a director of Journalism 360, an immersive storytelling initiative supported by Google News Lab and Knight Foundation. She has been a featured speaker on immersive storytelling at South, South by Southwest, AWE, Digital Hollywood, Art Table, and many more. Before venturing into the world of virtual reality, Laura worked in broadcast and digital media as a senior producer on Larry King Now, and NBC won an Emmy for her work on the 2016 Rio Olympics. She started a career on the original Yahoo News team and was an Entertainment Weekly, a PBS.org <clears throat> editor for Entertainment Weekly and PBS.org. A graduate of Bernard College, Columbia University, she has reported on politics, business, entertainment, lifestyle topics at a variety of outlets, including NPR, Rotten Tomatoes, and Los Angeles Magazine. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it is my esteemed honor to welcome these amazing panelists and to get into this exciting conversation, um, exploring news stories within the metaverse. I would love, love, love to hear from each of you and give each of you an opening remarks in order to share your thoughts. Um, starting with Tulana, I think there are two of you on the same on the same space. So both of you can <laughs> can go ahead. Then I'll go on to Laura as well as Kunle. So go ahead, Tulana. Um, thank you so much. We so are uh, very excited to be here um, from Sunny Dar es Salaam. Um, there's lots to talk about, and I'm very excited to just hear how much we've all been doing in our different areas and corners of the world and corners of the continent. Um, this is something, as we you know, with digital media, we're now doing the metaverse. As pioneers, you are kind of like cutting through the weeds, <laughs> cutting through the jungle to kind of create a way, and we only learn by doing, and we're just failing forward. So I'm just excited to hear um, um, from all of your experiences and to excited for us to share our own as well. Yeah, and uh, in the same note, uh, a big a big chunk of what we do is also we play. We play a lot, and so we hope we can bring a little bit of playfulness and a little bit of experimentation in, in uh, how we think about, uh, especially these new technologies. Like Tula said, you're, you're, when you're wayfaring, when you're, when you're pioneering anything, uh, you, you, you do have to, you know, cut through the weeds and, and, and the jungle, but at the same time, you, you have to remember to, that you're, you're trying things out and you have to carry that attitude. So we, we do kind of hope to, to bring that uh, punch to this uh, discussion on, on these technologies that sometimes feel a little alien. 
No, absolutely. I love I love the opening remarks both of you have shared um, <laughs> the Ona Stories team on on remembering to play. Um, definitely want to hear opening remarks from Laura and Kunle, and we'll definitely be, be talking about experimentation and ways it helps. Um, hi, Laura. Hi, thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, it's so great to hear from different parts of the world. I do a lot of talks in the US and I love hearing what's what's happening um, on the African continent. This is really exciting for me. Um, and I wanted to, to echo what Prince Lee said. I do think we forget about having fun. I think that's the reason we're kind of all in this space is because we like to be sort of the, the weirdos who are playing with new technology and figuring things out as we go. And I think if you forget to have fun with it, you know, why do it, right? So um, I, I agree. I think that's really, really important. And I think it's also great to be aware of how quickly things are changing. And if we don't stay on top of things as an industry, then we fall behind. And we've seen it happen time and time again. And so it's really inspiring to hear so many folks working on this new technology and thinking about ways that it can kind of inform our storytelling going forward. Excellent. No, I couldn't I'd rather go, go for it and just opening remarks because I'd love for us to, to get comfortable and have a family conversation around this topic. How are you? Thank you. Uh, on the subject of having fun, I'm glad you mentioned that. So we should also endeavor to have fun while having this conversation. I came across a quote from Charles Bukowski some days ago where he talked about the importance of uh, writing not being boring. And oftentimes we forget that uh, as journalists, we tend to want to stick to what has worked over the years, over the decades. Oh, this has worked for us. Let's just continue doing it. Uh, but after all, we're in the digital era, and that calls for us to also digitalize the work we're doing. And I think from the rise of TikTok, we, we would have realized also that I mean, the audience has maybe changed or the things that they enjoy, the things that they love uh, investing their time in are the things that in, in some ways entertain them. So I think we can also try to incorporate that in this profession and I'm sure we'll discuss more on that as, as we go on. No, absolutely. So a couple of things that I wanted to also delve into, um, having worked with Facebook and Meta and fairly recently working more on the accelerator program, but seeing how much news is around the metaverse itself, I'm excited because this is one of the few opportunities that maybe we get to delve on news stories within the metaverse, right? And I think for, for a few people, the folks who are watching this or may want to catch this as a recording, um, it might be okay for any, any one of you who may want to, to almost kind of like just open it up the conversation a bit. Because I think for most people who are listening, you're hearing this big announcement by a social media organization. You're hearing a lot of things on your regular radio or station, and particularly on our African continent, you're hearing about the metaverse and these new innovative technology. Um, but unfortunately, the reality is access to either the Oculus or the metaverse experience um, isn't as broad uh, or as widespread as everybody would like to, to, to think. And I think Maybe a good starting point is for us to just open the conversation on the nuance between this discussion on the news and the metaverse itself, um, how it applies to news stories and, and journalism and, and our space, and just early thinkings around that so that then we can start delving into the opportunities in both organizations and newscasts. Um, anyone can start and we can we can probably share and, and I'd be happy to, <laughs> to hear from all of you what, what we initially think um, and, and then sharing with our audience the difference and nuance between this discussion on new stories within the metaverse and then how access can maybe be something that um, advances that for, for our audience members. Please unmute to the okay. yeah, go ahead. Um, I think part of what you, your question is also touches on uh, the presentation we kind of like prepared for this was, um, just speaking specifically to the landscape, first of all, um, that's on the continent and how realistic we have to be as much as we have these exciting new words and all of things like that, but what does that, what does that mean on the ground? And I remember, I can give a very, just a small example of this, when we start thinking about the newsroom itself um, and, and stuff, because your news is, uh, you know, you are, you are a medium, you are writing, you are shooting video, whatever it might be. I remember 
remember learning during my first training around virtual reality, it was on a camp with other journalists and creators. It was in a, a Nairobi hackathon um, in, in, in Kenya. And then after the three days, you know, we're excited, we're given all this kit and stuff. And I just sat down with the trainers and I said, you know, my biggest challenge would be what? Translating all that you have said into Kiswahili. Because in Tanzania, we all speak Swahili more than we speak English. So for someone to, like even English, this word which virtual reality seems so, I don't know, it just doesn't <laughs> seem to translate. How am I translating it down to my common layman term where 90% of the newspapers here are in Swahili language, you see? So then there's still this breaking such barriers, these access barriers, we are thinking of them as technical, but even I think we need to think of them as contextual. And context, and that, and that's something that we kind of have to like, you know, kind of bring it back. I think sometimes with our education and exposure and things like that, we kind of expect that everybody is with it, right? Um, on the ground, as I speak, uh, the, you know, where we are in East Africa, specifically Tanzania, you know, the digital literacy is quite, quite high, right? Those smartphones and smartphones are penetrating social media and digital media are, 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 are growing. Uh, uh, numerous East African newsrooms, like Nation Media Group and the like, are, are changing their business model to go to that uh, level still, the numbers show you that radio is still king, right? That's where the penetration is at. And so um, still as we are as we're going and we're excited, one thing that, that, that brought us and that gave us humility, as it were, when we were you know, wanting to buy all the equipment and you know, all of that was so first deal with the context and then understand what the context requires first. Um, and so if in Kenya, for example, with our partners like right now, they uh, virtual reality picked up, you know, you know, very quickly. In Tanzania, it was not the same. People still ask us, so are you selling the glasses? So are you selling the glasses? You know, you know, they they the concept is not that. However, when we show them augmented reality, it's like, oh right, you know, yes. Can I do the my phone too, so I can unlock this story and this story and this story. So that kind of a thing. So figuring out the context of also your audience. But remember, at the same time, with newsrooms, we are all looking towards. We are, we are all being fed by our audience, right? We are being led by our audience. That's the people who uh, we determine what we write about, what what are the big stories that we're going to seek. And the like. So it's always listening to those things on the ground that I think we need to uh, be aware of the context. Absolutely brilliant. I, I love, I think you mentioned quite a bit on, on an important theme, technical versus contextual. Um, and I, I also love that you said, even with the adoption of mobile phones, um, the digital literacy is growing, but there's also language. And maybe for us um, as journalists and those of, of us in the, in the business of sharing information, language is incredibly key. Um, and, in, and you touching upon that hits and resonates as well. Um, radio still being king. So just understanding the majority platform of consumption is also key. Um, and then I love what you said, because I also have have a sentiment that maybe augmented reality, maybe a transition into, into maybe breadcrumbs of that metaverse journey rather than the immersive um, for gamut and scale. But I'd love to hear um, from you, Kunle, um, how you feel, and then I'd, I'd come to you, Laura. Uh, well, the concept of the metaverse is still pretty new, you know, even though we've had uh, virtual reality technologies for many years now. And it just shows that it's work in progress, even though there are challenges now, uh, uh, environmental challenges, uh, the effect it has on, on physical well-being, etc. Uh, those things will be improved on eventually. And I mean, so we understand also that the audience in Africa is quite peculiar. Um, especially when it comes to, as, as uh, Tilanana said, when it comes to digital literacy, when it comes to access to electricity, access to internet, etc. cetera. Um, but, but then again, you know, there, there are ways we can come in. Uh, you can, there, there, for, instance, for example, at Human Angle, we say so, certain stories are general audience stories, certain stories are special audience or special interest stories. And you know, it's not all the time that you also measure impact by the number of people who read, but also how much value they derive 
from the few people who interact with your stories. Uh, and you can't also say, you know, because that there are challenges with electricity, we should not invest in electric cars in Africa, right? So I think, you know, there are always ways to work around work around these challenges. And for me, there, there, there's just so much prospect, you know, in paying attention and investing in this. Uh, just to cite one example is, you know, how it might support, you know, storytelling for people with disabilities, considering the many elements that you can just put uh, in a story that's ex exhibited on the metaverse. So I think, you know, uh, there, there are a bunch of other things that we'll be discussing. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave Nora to also contribute. Thank you. No, thank you so much. Um, definitely appreciate that perspective, Kunle. And, and for the audience who are joining in, this is the baseline early conversation, just talking about access and metaverse itself and, and almost like making sure that the nuance of news within the metaverse um, is appreciated. Laura, I'd love to go to you um, now because I think even reading from your bio with the different teams you've worked with, you've had an expansive opportunity to um, explore news, and news outlets within augmented reality and with teams of that. Um, so I wanted to hear from you as well. Part of the opportunity with engagement is so global. What are, what, what are your thoughts on access um, and the benefits within Stories. Yeah, sure. And I apologize. They just started drilling on the elevator in my building. So that's a little bit of background noise. I have my headphones on, but hopefully it's not too loud. Um, yeah, no, I think um, I sort of like to take, um, well, I guess a couple different perspectives on this, because I think one is kind of separating what like covering the metaverse will be or covering news within the metaverse or covering content that's already happening in that space versus launching news stories in the metaverse and you know what can news organizations do to engage audience there by producing content in that space and i don't think we really know yet like what there's not enough people in there yet to sort of be covering it but i think we need to be experimenting in that space so we know what to expect when it happens um you know i'm less interested in using technology for technology's sake and more interested in like thinking about what are all the tools in the toolbox and how can VR and AR and whatever the next thing is in the metaverse, mixed reality, all these things, how can they, how can we think about them as just different platforms to tell stories in new ways? And kind of to Tulanana's point, you know, where is the audience and what's the best place to engage them on particular stories? So really taking a pretty granular look at what are the stories that lend themselves best to some of this experimentation versus being like, everything needs to be in the metaverse all the time or everything needs to be in VR. Um, I don't think that's true. And I don't think that's a really cost-effective way for any news organization anywhere in the world to kind of approach this. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of opportunity there and really being very uh, particular about how to explore that is great. And I agree, I think AR, AR is where I've spent most of my time um, working in the last couple of years, um, particularly web AR. And I think that you know the growth of just being able to launch something from a QR code, everybody having a smartphone, that accessibility is such a huge piece. Cause you know, you're right, like we don't, not only do people not even have the, the first Oculus, but now this new one that's incredibly expensive and, you know, is amazing. The technology is there and eventually it will trickle down, but, you know, we're not quite there yet. So being able to understand from a, um, you know, kind of academic and, you know, uh, experimental place, what's going to happen in that space is a little bit different than what can I launch for my audience that's here now. And both are important. No, thank you very much. And 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 maybe then that, that also leads us um, into the discussion because I, I think I love what Tulanana, Tulanana and Kumle have mentioned in terms of the opportunity, the willingness and exploration and particularly to Kumle's point about just because we may have electricity challenges doesn't mean we can't participate in electric vehicles, right? So, so understanding that we, we may not have as many um, folks in the metaverse because of, of equipment and access challenges doesn't mean that as, as journalists, we shouldn't be future casting what African stories should look like and contributing to that, right? Um, and to that, it, it, it leads to one of the, the interesting questions about then 
investment in the metaverse, right? Because I think for a lot of us, there is a cost to um, story production, content production, um, the phenomenal work that each of you are doing, there is an initial cost investment for that to happen. Um, so in reverse order from Laura, from your end, what what then makes sense in terms of for, pe for us thinking about storytelling within the metaverse, for news organizations wanting to participate, for us understanding both the barrier to access and also the limitations to storytelling, even on already yeah. existing traditional ones, what does investment look like in setting up for um, AR, VR storytelling in the metaverse? Yeah, I mean, I think all of the costs for these things have come down significantly in the past couple of years across the board. Um, I think you can kind of look at it two ways. Uh, one is the sort of bigger narrative storytelling that's possible in sort of that bigger scale VR that is a big investment. And the we, you know, we really haven't seen the return on investment in a long time on that. I think there's been, you know, things that go to film festivals and they win awards and that's really great and it pushes the boundaries. But for most news organizations, no matter where in the world you are, it's probably not, um, you know, something that right off the bat, yes, we're going to spend this, this huge amount of money to do it. But I think on the AR side of things, there's a little bit more in it. It's not, it's not necessarily like the sexiest approach, but it's what I'm really interested in, which is kind of the like change of workflow for a graphics editor, where we do know how to incorporate 3D objects. There's free resources online, um, things like Sketchfab and, you know, just pulling in 3D objects when it's relevant to a story and being able to use web AR and include those in interesting ways and sort of thinking about the future of the internet as like a 3D internet. So really just thinking about how can I, on a much smaller scale, just enhance the story that I'm telling, let somebody, you know, if it's a story about a space, you know, lunar space module, something like, can I pull the model of that that's freely available and incorporated into a story? Or can I take my phone and just do photogrammetry on an object? I've seen really great examples of this done, even with like food stories or, you know, entertainment stories where you're working with the uh, film company to scan, you know, a, a kind of figurine from a movie, that kind of thing. Um, and just enhance your storytelling in that way and kind of start small and start building up from there. And it, it serves both the kind of low barrier to entry as a journalist where you don't have to know much in the way of technology or unity or any of these platforms to get something done, but also helps kind of teach your audience, like, what is this thing that I'm now kind of expected to like turn around on my screen or pull up in AR? They sort of start to learn to expect that type of content. And when I was at Yahoo, we saw a lot of success um, just from those smaller scale projects. Uh, we had, you know, we had some fun, bigger narrative things too. And obviously that's more kind of fun from a storytelling perspective, but I think it's really important to start training your audience and thinking about what are these kind of small things that we can do and what do we have coming up on a, you know, a, a month ahead, three weeks ahead a very, like, what are the predictable events that we could plan some cool content around? Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, now I'll be going to my home team, and this is where we'll spend a little bit more time because I appreciate where where Laura comes from. But from her bio, you can see she with organizations that are willing to put and and test and and put investments in pushing kind of the narrative. Um, but when I come down to you, Team Ona and Kunle, we are in a place where <laughs> ah we are telling stories as we are making the money, and we are making money as we are trying to tell the story. So there's a <laughs> there's almost like um. A water must, or the, the rubber must meet the road with our um, sustainability models and journalism and then and the capacity we have to be innovative. Um, Kunle, I'll go to you first. And, and when I come to you, Team Ona, I know you also have a presentation. Um, and and if, you, if that's something that you still want to share, we can dive into what that looks like for your storytelling, the storytelling process a bit deeply so that our audience can grasp some of the ways in which we're able to do that in, innovatively and still future cast it. Um, even with constraints. Um, but Kunle, so, so this section is about the investment and cost of it. So um, please, please go ahead. Yes, so um, Laura has said a lot already. Um, I mean, to even get a plot of land in the metaverse costs thousands of dollars and a lot of newsrooms do, simply do not have that money. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think a way out, the we should start looking into is uh, encouraging more partnerships and collaboration. Uh, for example, 
my story that was exhibited in Meta Mini Metaphors was as a result of collaborative efforts between my newsroom and then the Center for Collaborative Investigative Journalism in the US. And you know, there are also grants available from people with the resources and who are willing to experiment. For example, the Google News Initiative for, uh, might, might, might be uh, an opportunity for newsrooms in Africa to also say, oh yeah, we're doing this, we have this kind of content and we think we can push it into this format that will be relevant for this kind of audience. And if we're thinking more along that line, we should be able to easily you know, surmount that challenge. And, then, and again, as Laura said, we should also be willing to start small. Uh, you can start with interactive content, with augmented reality. Uh, I mean, there are even platforms that allow you to exhibit pictures online. So they, they create like virtual museums. So you just upload the pictures and the audience can interact with themselves as they are looking at uh, the multimedia elements and the captions. So those are also like really great places to start. Oh, thank you very much. And, and I think that um, what also for our storytellers who are on there who want to participate in that, I know Laura touched in and same with Kunle on open source, free to access type of online resources that allow some of our stories to be converted into some of those. Please drop some of them in the comment section and for our audience, because I think maybe part of the, the, the takeaway that would be great for an audience member is how then do I participate in AR, VR in a, in a cost effective way? Um, and that could be helpful. Timona, I know Princely are itching to share. Please go ahead um, and, and, and do so. And then after this round, for, for the, the speakers who are ready, we'll go into your presentation so our audience have a, a flavor and understanding of what you're presenting. Yeah. So yeah, the, the, just the one thing I kind of wanted to touch on is uh, something Laura mentioned uh, about, and this is idea I like to think about that regardless of the tools, regardless of the platforms, regardless of you know or, or whatever wherever you're telling a story, a story remains a story, and this is something we really like to emphasize uh, that. Um, Platforms and tools and technologies, all of these are just constraints, right? But within constraints, that's where you find the, the freedom to, 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 to tell stories, right? I see, I see Laura pumping the air uh, on that point, right? When, when we talk about, uh, you know, we talk about uh, adopting an attitude of play, for example, uh, but what are games? Games are constraints. Um, what is a platform? A platform is a constraint. Uh, all of these are, are just constraints that you design around. And as, but as a storyteller, um, your, the, the things that matter to you in the metaverse are the same that matter to you outside the metaverse. So uh, talking about being audience first, right? Audience led, that doesn't change. What changes is how many degrees of freedom the, the VR headset your, your, your uh, viewer uh, has, that can change. But the fact that you're thinking about your audience first, that doesn't change. Um, the narrative arc, that doesn't change regardless of where you're telling, uh, where you're telling your story. Um, so, so, so the big insight here is that um, we should view the metaverse, these, this, this universe of you know, different technologies, immersive technologies, as another tool, another set of constraints to, to uh, design around. But storytelling, the fundamentals of storytelling, those stay the same. A story is a story, regardless of where you're telling it. And what matters to your audience, uh, the fact that you have to have a clear narrative arc, the fact that emotive stories, you know, like tapping into people's emotions will, will do better than if you don't do that. All of those things, they stay exactly the same in the metaverse, outside the metaverse, on, on print, on anything. Yeah, Princely, oh, speaking my language. Thank you. That's beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, just to, I mean, just to, to echo that, I mean, that's, you know, we've always had constraints and I think people get very scared about the here metaverse or they hear VR, AR, and they're like, oh, it's some new thing I have to learn. And it's like, well, you used to have a word count in the newspaper. We still have a word count in the newspaper that you 
you know, can't go beyond you you have a time limit on on video pieces all of all artists have constraints a choreographer has the stage or the you know painter has a canvas and you know those are what make us creative and we just you know it's it's not so different i think we get really scared about the words but um it's exactly the same no excellent and and so <laughs> with that kind of groundbreaking and, and setting the baseline for us talking about stories within the metaverse and others i know some the speakers have presentations so go ahead um, team ona i know your presentation is ready go for it all right thank you thank you thank you laura i think we're, we're very much on the same page there and we'll chat uh, after the session as well on that exactly um, thank you guys. Um, so we wanted to speak a little bit about um, how these uh, entering the metaverse and the opportunities and the challenges that are presented by uh, kind of introducing these new uh, digital technologies, new emerging technologies into the newsroom. But first, I think, as I noted before, uh, one of the most important things for us is to understand the landscape where we are in um, for, for us to be able to, as it's a conversation, saying, for you to know where you are going, you must know your past, right? So you have to understand that with what we have already, radio is still king, as I said, though we have digital newsrooms that are uh, uh, are, are springing up and mushrooming every, every day. They're trying to, um, uh, a lot of mushrooming uh, um, online outlets, because um, everybody right now has a phone. There's lots of, like, in Tanzania, we have, I think, like, I think almost every day, I think maybe or something, uh, online TVs, and it's just to another online TV, Quincy online TV, whoever's online TV, and they're all decided that they're going to do what they call news. But also we find that, like, we did, like they also just, um, we find that uh, newsrooms are still trying to play catch up. Um, um, I think in the beginning when they saw a lot of how Facebook was coming in, Instagram, you know, you, you've just caught on to how to do a Facebook Live, and now there's Instagram Live, and then boom, there's now TikTok. So we're trying to figure out what that is again, and whether they will have any influence. And so it's a constant game of catch up, and I'm trying to understand where to even invest that money. But going on to like just the landscape, you can see the numbers there. Um, consistently, print is is has been uh, trending on the lower end. Uh, uh, radio has been quite consistent, and social media and internet have, have been growing, um, and, and those and, and that's a, a, a new study from 2020, just two years ago, of 16 countries here uh, on the continent. Um, but again, on the ground, I didn't want to just go over the newsrooms. I wanted to also talk about the experimentation that's been happening in newsrooms across the continent as well. Um, we shouldn't just assume that just because people are coming up, with these, these things people are trying to do and trying to introduce as I go along. So one people. Some examples I wanted to speak about was, you know, drone journalism that we're seeing kind of like spinning up, and that's been the, I gave an example of uh, Africa Skycam. These are people in South Africa kind of doing balcony view journalism, bird's eye view of larger context, that gives a larger context on the social issues on the ground. Um, um, the, the brilliant story that I loved, uh, or this is a story, it's more like of a series of stories called Unequal Scenes, and you can see by the picture there, they essentially were just taking areas um, uh, like here in Johannesburg and just comparing uh, uh, the social economic divide that's there and how it came to that to that area. Um, and so they've done this in Nairobi, then it spread and got into like other countries across the world, Mumbai, you name it. So these are kind of experimentations that are going and, and are, are winning. Um, um, uh, this was, I'll go into data journalism here in Tanzania. That's something that's also Kind of, I don't say I can't say picking up per se. There are people who are just, you know, kind of like trying to push that this there's, there's a there's a need for things like this. As you said, as Kunle said, there is sometimes peculiar uh, responses to new ways of doing things. And so, Nukta uh, Africa is actually a, a, a startup that was started by a journalist who, who was at, you know, a leading newspaper here in in, in, in this. Uh, in and he started to the citizen, and then he decided to become to, to venture more into the journalism. And as you can see there, all of this is done in another language, it's done in Swahili. Uh, in Swahili. So he's in trying to introduce this contextually to the people here. Uh, 
Um, it's not as fancy and what and what, but it's something that's very important to start, as um, Dora said, on the ground, like you start with what's there and things that are going to uh, make happen. And with that, with those things in mind, um, as we're introducing the metaverse into the museum, we have still like a clear kind of like understanding of what we are facing already on the ground in terms of uh, 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 people who are actually trying to play and do things and how those things are doing and bearing on. Uh, we'll pass it on to Lina to take us to the future and what that means. Yeah, so, so that, that's kind of a picture of how things are now and kind of where we're coming from, where we are. Um, but many times when we think, when we speak of the metaverse, you know, it's, it's this very vague, very um, concept, very wobbly concept. Um, but it's, it's, it's useful to think of the metaverse not as a technology per se, but as a universe of, of connected technologies. And, and three of the important ones um, being extended reality, which itself you can unpack into you know, virtual reality and augmented reality and mixed reality. Um, and then uh, there's, you know, the blockchain and Web3 and um, artificial intelligence. But the, the, the main point I kind of want to make here is, is, is um, the same one, that when you're thinking of any new platform, as a newsroom, as a storyteller, you're, you're just trying to figure out what the constraints of that platform are. That's all you're doing, really. You're, you're trying to figure out... Um, what are the limits that this, uh, this technology or this, this universe of connected technologies uh, applies to me as a storyteller? And then how can I push those limits? First, you have to understand the limits so that you can start uh, pushing them. Um, you, you know, if, you, if you try to push limits you don't understand, you probably, you know, you probably end up in, 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 in a rut. Um, <clears throat> so we, we were thinking about just... Uh, we, we kind of put down opportunities within the metaverse into this idea of three C's, right? And uh, the, the, the three C's within, you know, like all the different opportunities that, that we were discussing are opportunities in building digital communities, opportunities for commerce, and uh, what interests us maybe most as, as storytellers is an opportunities to co-create experiences. And I'll, I'll, I'll just break this down a little bit. When, when we speak about this first C of, of community, um, a lot of what I'm going to say and a lot of what I'm saying is, is just to, to remove this idea that you're going to be doing things uh, extremely differently from the real world because now you're in this new technology, whatever. At the core of us as humans, we're community, seek, we're community seeking species. We're, we're social animals. Right, and and what what the metaverse uh, just gives us an opportunity to digitize these communities of ours in in uh, in, in a way that maybe we've not seen before. But uh, the, the 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 first uh, opportunities that we have been seeing have been not just online communities; they've been offline communities of of of, of Tanzanians building stuff for the metaverse, of of Tanzanians building stuff for uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. So, so, for example, uh, on, on this point, uh, one thing that we have explored is we've created something called the Ona Stories Creator Network. And that cre within that creator network, we've, we've, we've put together uh, 297 uh, young Tanzanian creative professionals uh, who we train, we connect them to jobs, we, we, uh, we help them uh, essentially uh, professionalize. We get clients, it, it, it came out of a constraint as well. We, we used to get clients, storytelling clients. Uh, they want to explore AR, they want to explore VR, they want to explore just traditional storytelling, but we couldn't do uh, everything ourselves. Uh, but then we saw that we can uh, create a community, this idea of community, that uh, if, if we train people and connect them to the clients that we have and we're not really using, uh, we, we can push this ecosystem forward. Um, the, the, the second part of, of uh, commerce is all the different business models that will come up uh, out of this. The, the early ones, you know, we've been seeing things like NFTs, people exploring uh, NFTs and smart contracts. Um, and, and, and there are going to be all these other different, there's people selling land 
uh, you know, like this virtual land on, 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 on the metaverse, right? So, so it's going to open up op different opportunities for, for commerce. And I'm sure maybe Laura and Kunle will talk about uh, specifics uh, within this. But, but uh, so beyond communities and commerce, I think as storytellers, we're super excited about the fact that now uh, you can co-create an experience with your audience. So, so a, a key difference uh, between, let's say, uh, storytelling in, in VR and AR with uh, traditional storytelling, whether it's print or radio or TV, a key difference is that your audience is part of your story in a way they've never been before. In, in, uh, we, we call, you know, when, when, you're, when you're directing a film, you're actually called a director because you're pointing out, you're directing people's attention. You're saying, look here. Okay, now look at this thing. Okay, now I'll take you to another scene. In VR, it's a little different. You're still directing people's attention, but they've got a lot more freedom to not look where you want them to look, right? So, so, so very much when you are when you're creating or you're telling a story within virtual reality, you're co-creating it with your audience. Uh, the same with 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 the rest of, uh, of of immersive media. It's it's uh, in in a in a way that we've probably never seen before. Your audience is an active participant in your story. So, so these three things, these three C's are the opportunities that we see. Our communities both online and offline uh, to, to build for the metaverse and build in the metaverse. Uh, commerce, opportunities for commerce in terms of um, stuff like NFTs, uh, stuff like the, the new uh, business models, uh, new digital business models, and co-created uh, experiences. But there's one last C that I want to capture, uh, one more little C here as an opportunity, that is uh, the C of conventions. And the idea here is that uh, the same idea I started with, the idea of play, right? That we are building out these new conventions. Uh, uh, th this is a quote that I like from uh, Jan Janet Murray, one of the foremost researchers on VR uh, who wrote Hamlet on the holodeck. Uh, everyone should should read that. Uh, but she talks about how a VR headset is not a mature medium. It is only a platform and an unstable and uncomfortable one at that. Um, it's still very, very early in this game. And and, and I, I don't actually agree with this idea that, you know, Africa, oh, you know, like access is important. All of those things are important. But this is uh, one of the few instances in history where we are starting together. The whole world is figuring this out, you know? Laura in, in the US and Kunle in Nigeria and ourselves in Dar es Salaam and Luazi and, and, and everybody, you know, all around the world. These are, are conventions that we are, uh, we're building them as we go along. Tula gave a really great metaphor, you know, like cutting out the, the weeds and, and, and clearing the path. So, so the, the last C is, is to think of these conventions. When I say this, I mean, for example, We've been doing uh, some work here in, in, in translation, right? Just translating these words. What is virtual reality in Swahili? Uh, what is augmented reality in Swahili? It's, it's super basic stuff, but we're setting these conventions. We're starting uh, things off. And then uh, things like, you know, experimentation. We've been seeing our friends, uh, Black Rhino, for example, uh, doing really experimental stuff with, with, with uh, virtual reality uh, and, and, and what you can do. But the idea here is that there's opportunities to... To, uh, to create these conventions ourselves. So the four opportunities that we see, community, commerce, co-created experiences, and a reminder that we're at the very, very beginning of this. We're co-inventing these conventions. No, thank you so much. Um, for all those who've joined in, we're exploring new stories inside the metaverse. Um, we've listened to an engaging, and, and I love like almost like bullet points to the three C's and the opportunities while well, the four C's as Prince Lee uh, to Nanana and the owner stories team have shared with us. Um, we will be going into a, a quick ad break from um, the, the Jamfest team. Please make sure um, that you're, you're following. You can drop questions in the Q&A section. The hashtag to follow is hash on, on plug 2022. When we come back from the ad break, um, Laura and Kunle would have an opportunity to give their presentations with, with about 10 minutes of, as well. Um, but the team at the JFS team, we can go for ad breaks now and we'll be back shortly. I hope you're enjoying and engaged with the conversation as well.
Excellent. I hope all of you have been engaged. This is such a wonderful, wonderful conference. I, I love all things journalism. And if you're joining in our specific session of the amazing, amazing panelists, I feel like I'm learning every opportunity I get. We're exploring new stories inside the metaverse. And I know that we have the baseline of kind of breaking apart the nuance between reporting about <laughs> the metaverse itself. And then for those of us who are interested in fun and play, um, and co-creating uh, news stories within the metaverse, um, and, and also opportunities to discuss things such as access, things um, such as storytelling to a general audience and storytelling to special interest audience, and the, the opportunity for stories to, to reach places and spaces that probably hasn't happened before. Um, you're joining into this. That's been the kind of richness this conversation has been so far, and we're looking forward to, to continuing it as well. Um, I have my man Kunle up next, and each speaker has about 10 minutes or so to give a presentation, and then they'll go back into kind of ruminating a bit more on a few questions um, around storytelling and in the metaverse. For those of you who are joining on the platform and you're online, there's Q&A um, button that you can put in and drop any questions that you may want to ask that I don't, I don't think about or I think to ask the speakers or doesn't come up in discussion, and I'll be happy to read it on your behalf. Um, and for those of you who are social media savvy, um, the Twitter hashtag is JamFest and the 22, and then the hashtag Unplug22 as well. My man Kunle, please go ahead. Your turn. All right, thanks, Manu. Um, so I will be discussing in the next 10 minutes uh, what lessons I got from uh, Metaverse installation experience at Human Angle. Uh, well, I want to start by saying I think my very first experience with virtual reality uh, as a child was when I started using the Microsoft Encarta application. It's like a, an encyclopedia. And if you all remember, it had this uh, virtual 3D tour of various uh, hallmarks at Coliseum in Rome the pyramids in Egypt, and it was a wonderful experience because it was fresh, it was immersive, and I think whatever we're discussing today is just an improvement on that. Um, and then uh, this is what I'll be sharing, the background to the report I did, the advantages, and what I consider to be the limitations and lessons from that experience. So last year, we started working on uh, this report uh, that looks at climate change, uh, desert encroachment, and how it exacerbates conflict between pastoralists, uh, those who head cows and cattle, and farmers, farming communities in Nigeria. And so in November uh, 2021, my colleague and I, Murutal Abdullahi, uh, we ventured into communities in Yobe State, in Adamawa, uh, northeastern Nigeria, to number one, see the impact, how uh, the impact of the desertification on these communities, and to also interview um, farmers, to interview headers, to interview stakeholders, community leaders, uh, and experts on what they consider to be the impacts of this crisis. And so it was, it was a story that had a lot of visual elements uh, of the desert. We went to the uh, Unguru wetlands. Uh, we looked at the proliferation of typha grass and how it was, you know, the floodplains, uh, the farms. We saw farmers working on their farms. We saw, we saw a farmer who, was, who had um, arrows sticking out from his chest and his arm. Uh, the arrows had been, the injury had been inflicted, uh, inflicted on him by headers, pastoralists, and it, the foundation of all this is just the resource scarcity and um, competition over these resources, land, water, etc. And so there are a lot of visual elements and videos that we took while on the field. And uh, the, our partners, the Center for Collaborative Investigative Journalism, felt this was just a perfect story that could be also you know expanded into the metaverse and that was exactly what we did i think later on another session is coming up where jeff and serena from ccij will be taking us 
through a tour of this space. Uh, so I don't have to dwell into that. But what I consider to be the benefits from this experience uh, is just how much you can do with it. Number one, it takes massive storytelling to a whole new level. And like uh, uh, Princely mentioned, the fact that you can co-create experiences in this space, I think that there, there's just so much you can do with it. And, and I'm filled with excitement at, at this thought. For example, you know, I, I do a lot of conflict reporting. I report about humanitarian issues, the experiences of IDPs, uh, the experiences of war victims, etc. And I'm thinking, rather than narrate these experiences from these people as a journalist, what if you can create what it means to be at the war front? You, you know, if you're familiar with games that uh, give you 3D experiences like Second Life, you people, the emotions that we have in the real world are transferred when we play these 3D games. So when your character is shot in that game, for example, you you feel that emotional attachment to the character, right? And so if you can create an experience where somebody is at the battle front, because it's easy to just read the article and say, oh yeah, maybe it's not that bad, maybe they're exaggerating. And then you say, based on real life interviews, this is the closest, the accurate representation that we can give. So you are there as somebody whose village is getting raided and you know, you have to make choices. Where do you run? How do you hide? And, and then you look at, you also try to calibrate the uh, level of risk and impute that in a 3D world. And something else you can do is, you know, uh, also recreate a roundtable discussion. So when, for example, something we've been trying to do is to, it's called transitional justice, getting the victims of war and the perpetrators of violence into the same room, and letting them have conversations about you know their various perspectives uh, you know, i think we think this would lead to healing this would lead to rehabilitation this would lead people to uh, recover from the trauma that they faced and move on with their lives so what you can do is also when you get these people into the same room you can recreate that conversation so that at any time somebody can walk into that room and see them speak to each other have that back and forth and uh, you know you also recreate the facial expressions and all that. And another, uh, the final example I'll give is when you, and this one relies heavily on artificial intelligence. So if you are able to get like hundreds of transcripts of interviews, and then impute that into AI, then you can create digital replicas of individuals that fit certain demographics. Say people who face sexual violence. Uh, say internally displaced people, refugees, and so people can go there and ask questions and get responses that, that, that uh, based on the materials imputed, you know, to start with. Uh, so moving on is the fact also that you can incorporate images, videos, sounds, and 3D objects into this world. So you're not limited to text, you're not limited to black and white, you're not limited to uh, just video and audio visuals, you can have everything at the same time in one space. And it's also really uh, profound that you can have interaction between the viewers. And that was one of the things I noticed when we exhibited uh, our story is that you will find other people in the same environment also moving around and you can actually talk to them and say, hey, what do you think about this? Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, uh, and then interact, network, discuss the story, discuss insights, and this makes the experience a lot, a lot richer. And then I think, I mean, when I was there, I didn't have the haptic suit, I didn't have the headset, but I was still able to experience it using my laptop screen and using my um, avatar. So it's not, it's not essential or mandatory that I have this equipment, but it makes the experience better. So. Uh, I think that's, that's for me is also like a benefit and any the potential for monetization. So a lot of, a lot of newsrooms in Africa today are now exploring uh, paywalls. So they're saying, oh, we have some, some, our content is so good that we don't think we should be giving it out of, giving it out for free. And you can equally, you do this in the metaverse and make it possible for people to enter a room and, and see 
the things that you want them to see uh, free of charge. But there are also rooms that you would limit access to that unless you pay for that experience, you won't be able to get it. So I think that's, that's also possible. And then the potential for new audience. But like Laura said, uh, discussing the interaction, intersection between journalism and metaverse is not just about exhibiting news in the metaverse. It's also about reporting the news, reporting activities, activities taking place in the metaverse as journalists. And uh, uh, Second Life, which is a virtual uh, reality game that's been in existence since, I think, 2003 or the early 2000s, has millions of users, uh, over 70 million. And you have about hundreds of thousands of people who are active every day. So this just means that there, there are new audiences that we can have access to in the metaverse as journalists. So you can create places where news can be discussed, places where they can listen to news, places where they can watch your documentaries while they're having fun in these places. Uh, so moving on to the lessons and limitations. So limitation number one is funding. We've, we've talked about this extensively. I'm not going to dwell on it anymore. The rare technical expertise required to actually develop these things. Uh, the nausea, like I said, the, the toll that it takes on you if you're using the haptic suit and if you have headsets for long periods of time, which I'm sure will be improved upon. Uh, and then the founder, I mean, it's interesting that the founder of LinkedIn Lab, uh, Philip Rosedale, recently mentioned that we might not even need to use the headset to uh, and the gloves to be able to tell what a person is doing and you know uh, reflect that in the metaverse. You can simply just use the webcam, and the webcam will be able to capture the physical movements of the person in front of the screen, and then you know just uh, have the avatar do the same thing in the metaverse. So that that makes it a lot easier if, once it's realized. And then the fact that um, you know the, the new audience and viewership that you get from uh, doing that. So the lessons, uh, number one, it may not work for all kinds of stories. Uh, I, I, I think this, the, the stories that you should, number one, it's, it's uh, capital intensive. So you also do not want to waste it on all kinds of stories. You want to be sure that you are doing it for stories that are worth it and stories that you think uh, that 3D virtual experience would add value to how the audience experiences or reads the story. So it could be uh, stories with a lot of visual elements. It could be stories like uh, Tlanana was talking about uh, data journalism. So you can see the charts in real time. You can interact with the charts in real time rather than just seeing the 2D uh, uh, Excel bar charts on your screen. And then also, uh, I think, underscores the need for collaboration because this is not something that singular newsrooms can do by, the, by themselves. We need to, it's a work in progress. We are improving the technology. and We also need to pull resources together. And then we can start small. I've talked about this earlier. Laura has talked about this earlier. Uh, finally, I think it's necessary that we hammer on the points that we all need to adapt. It's a digital world. Uh, people want to be entertained as much as they want to get enlightened and educated. And we need to constantly talk about how we can do this. And the Metaverse for me presents a wonderful opportunity to do that for people to you know, uh, have fun while also having new experiences, learning things about the world that they would ordinarily not be able to learn uh, otherwise. Thank you. I think that will be all. Nice, nice, nice. No, amazing, Kone. Um So many things came, came to mind as you were sharing that. And I think um, I also appreciate specifically your perspective of investigative journalism and also immersive experience. And so, the, the early talk or conversation about not this, not just um, some of the technical advances on use of hardware and environment, but also contextual opportunities that the metaverse uh, presents that Tivanana mentioned. I think you, you kind of gave a very good success story of how that, that can show up. Um, and in investigative journalism, um, you know, creating context for which people can appreciate um, news items, which includes conflicts. And that's one of the top topical things. Those, most TV radio broadcasts report especially on conflict and and seeing ways in which conflict resolution and tools within 
um, immersive technology and the use of uh, metaverse can bridge the gap between um, context between situations that have happened is very interesting and incredibly intriguing. I think one of the audience members asked in, in line to that, um, that it, yes, it's incredibly fascinating, but at the kind of like biological level questions to think about is um, how audience members now inundated with, with more um, opportunities to emote. So the simulation of maybe the conversation during wartime um, um, situations with perpetrators and victims um, and how, how maybe we're thinking of um, managing the situation in which our audience would be receiving that um, and, and then understanding the additional kind of like emotive values that um, being in the metaverse to see that can have. Um, I'd, I'll leave that for you all to, to share. I, I just wanted to draw a parallel to, to I think in the real world, when, when we visit things like the Holocaust museums, or for those of you, so I'm speaking from South Africa right now um, in Joburg and, and just flew in a couple of hours ago. But if, if you've, you're also, you've also gone to see Robben Island or you've gone to follow apartheid and post-apartheid and some of the, the historical museums that speak to, and I think quite a number of, of countries also have that. From my home country in Ghana, we have Cape Coast castles, whether it's it's from the Dutch and others, and you go into the dungeons and see slave trade and others. There's a bit of, of that emotive value in seeing um, history that is being reported over time about it, uh, people's lived. Um, so maybe that that can give some flavors of, of how that type of reporting affects other folks. But definitely, Kunle, if you have any additional thoughts in, in response to our audience member, happy to hear that. And then we'll go to Laura. Uh, well, well, not really. I'm, I'm glad you, you emphasized the emotive um, elements in all this. Um, uh, so I was listening to, I don't know if you've heard this podcast episode called How to Build the Met Metaverse. That's the journal, the um, I mean, podcast of the Wall Street Journal has been released. And I think it's a four-part, it's currently a four-part series. And uh, one of the very early players of second life was sharing our experience about when so the first thing is that it allows you to i mean if you if you would rather identify as another gender you can do that in, the, in metaverse if you would rather look uh funkier you can you can change your avatar however, however you please so it gives a lot of freedom and that that freedom to determine how your character looks and how, I mean, the freedom to also determine the activities of your character. Do you want your character to be a pianist? Do you want to be a gardener? Do you want to be a realtor? Do you want to be a businessman? Do you want to even go into crime? It, it, it creates that emotional connection between you as an individual and the character. And it also means that you can do things with your virtual body that you, you can't do in the real world. And so I think as journalists, we can take advantage of this. Uh, uh, so it's not just you playing a game anymore. It's you entering a different world as a version of you that you would want. So if we can capitalize on that and say, and allow people to, for example, experience irregular migration, say, OK, what does it take to travel from Nigeria to Italy via the Sahara Desert? And then you can experience that in the metaverse and see all the dangers and see how it's difficult to have 30 people in a small boat trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea. And I, I, I think it just gives new experiences and makes people appreciate, you know, without having to do, without having to endanger themselves, appreciate what the people who undertake that, those journeys or have those experiences have to go through. Thank you so much, Kunle, and thank you so much for asking a question. Um, definitely want to hear, I know, Laura, you probably have a presentation as well. Let me, give me the thumbs up when you're ready, and then we'll have that. Um, and, okay, so Laura's <clears throat> needs a, a little bit of a second, but as we're waiting I'm for okay. that. Oh, you're good? Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm good, sorry. Um, yeah, no, and just to kind of respond to that last 
question that the audience member asked as well. I think, you know, what you mentioned about the museums, Holocaust Museum, Robin Island and others, I think one of the things they do really well is they prepare you for that experience before you go into it. You're sort of ready, you know what you're about to sort of be put into. And I think that's something we forget about with technology. And I think it's really, really important the experience before you put on the headset, before you launch the AR experience, whatever it is, is just as important as the experience itself. And I think that's how we really protect ourselves and prepare ourselves to kind of be emotionally involved in these really intense experiences. Now, excellent. Laura, did you have a specific presentation um, that you I, wanted I to do? Yes. <laughs> I do, but I'll do, I know we're kind of short on time, so I'll, I'll zoom through a little bit quickly, but I will, I will put it up so that we can get into so wait, that. You have, you have we have about 10 minutes, so don't don't feel rushed. Okay. Go ahead and do that. Um, and, and I'll make a point just as you're you're ready. And when you're ready, just give me a thumbs up. Um, there we go. Also to the question about it, I think for a lot of us, um, fact checking um, and ethics and integrity and also just um, and the opportunity for nuance and balanced stories is something that the industry of journalism constantly grapples with. Um, and so um, after Laura's presentation, we may also explore that as in which ways can we make sure that there's, there's either balance, fact checking, and a credible opportunity for people using the metaverse um, and exploring new stories. Because I think there are other things, there's entertainment, there's education, there's so many things that the metaverse um, can lend itself to. Um, but in our field, it will probably be interesting to touch a, bit, a bit on a, a few of those. Go ahead, Laura. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to talk a little bit um, kind of more specifically about some of the tools that um, I've explored in VR and AR and kind of how uh, how and when newsrooms can uh, think about exploring that space. So like we've talked a little bit about, I think um, a story can be immersive in a number of ways. I don't like to think of it exclusively as a new technology space. I think that's one way of doing it. And obviously incorporating 3D, AR and VR headset technology is one way to do that. But I think it also can be about collaboration and community, about bringing artists and photographers into your storytelling space, about thinking who in your community can really add to these stories and add to your journalism and kind of bring that into your reporting in new and interesting ways. And then also thinking about physical space. We just mentioned some of these museums that have done such a great job of really bringing you into an environment. And I don't think there's um, a, you know, a reason that our journalism can't do similar things. And sometimes that might be through a headset, but sometimes it might be about engaging a specific place in your community, whether that's a gallery or um, a community space, a public venue, a theater, uh, I think really thinking about the places in your community that these stories could live in an interesting way um, is another way to kind of engage that um, immersive piece. I wanted to bring it like all the way back. I uh, was a history major in college and I really like kind of understanding where things come from um, and just kind of getting across the point that like none of this is that new. Um, the picture there is a stereoscope. It's from the Smithsonian. Uh, in Washington, D.C. It's from the 1860s. And this was a way during the Civil War in the U.S. for pretty wealthy people to bring images from the war into their homes. People were experiencing this. And, you know, it doesn't look that different from the VR headsets that we know today. So just kind of getting across that this is not a, a brand new idea, but obviously we've built on it in any number of ways. Um, kind of the next step, we kind of jump another almost 100 years ahead. But there was a TV program uh, called You Are There. It was hosted by Walter Cronkite, who was kind of the most trusted name in news in the US in the 50s and, and 60s. And this was a dramatized version of historic events. And so, you know, we think now like, oh, these, what are our journalistic ethics when it comes to sort of telling stories from the past or telling stories, uh, you know, that are docudrama, that kind of thing. And that's not a totally new idea either. We had a very trusted news anchor who was producing a show that was talking about, about history. And so I think it's very useful to kind of look back on some of these examples and think about how we tell stories now. And then jumping um, significantly more ahead to 2012. Um, this piece is called Hunger in Los Angeles. It was done by Nani de la Pena, who was kind of known as, uh, she, she hates this moniker, I think sometimes, but the godmother of VR. And she really was a leader, is a leader in this space. And this was her first 
piece that went to Sundance um, in 2012. And it was one of the first docu documentary immersive pieces that Sundance did in their New Frontier Festival. Um, it was built on what then later became the Oculus. And it used real audio uh, from folks in, in downtown Los Angeles who were um, uh, in, in line at a, I think it's at a soup kitchen in downtown LA. And it used their real audio and then created avatars in this space. So it brought up a lot of questions about what is real? What are the ethics of journalists in this space? How do you tell stories uh, with avatars versus with scans of real people? And uh, we've obviously built so much, Nani herself has built so much on this idea in the last 10 years. And it's really important to kind of look back at our origins, where we came from. And, you know, kind of like Tulanana and Princey were saying earlier, like the constraints are what make things interesting. And I think that, um, you know, the ethics are the same, the same way that the constraints tell the stories the same way, the ethics are the same. When you have your um, guidelines as a journalist, those don't change in the metaverse and those don't change in VR and AR. Uh, so if you if you have a good foundation, you'll have a good foundation for telling stories in this new space as well. So what does it mean to talk about XR for newsrooms today? Um, just to jump into a couple of pieces that I think have done a very interesting job of exploring this space. Uh, the one on the left uh, just won an Emmy Award. It's from The New Yorker. Uh, it's a piece called Reeducated, and um, it's about the, uh, the about the uh, imprisonment of the minority community of younger in uh, China. And that one was a really interesting mix of um, of uh, animation and VR and audio and really in-depth investigative reporting. And it's something that can be experienced in a headset but also online and you get a really great kind of overview of what's happening and a really interesting kind of like one-to-one -one storytelling of uh, from people there. So I think that one was a really amazing project. It was a long project. I mean, these are these two pieces that I'm talking about now are things that were months and more than years in the, in the making. And I think that's where we were talking about before, like what's the investment. So to do these kind of long projects, it does take um, a lot of time and a lot of investment, but it doesn't mean that it's, not sometimes worth it and that you can't do really interesting work there. The one on the right is from the New York Times. It's a piece called Traveling While Black. It was at Sundance a couple of years ago. Um, and it uh, tells the story of the Green Book and, and traveling uh, during segregation in America. And kind of what I like about it is it mixes historical video with um, current conversations and and you know real life examples today so i thought that was a really great one to kind of look at it's all available on the new york times site i think so all of these are also available to look at i think that's another thing to keep in mind like some of the technology some of the pieces i've worked on you can't get to anymore because the technology has changed so quickly and uh thinking about how we archive some of this content and keep it relevant is also something i'm very interested in um some of the things I've worked on more recently are more in the AR space. Uh, you can actually scan that QR code to bring this up. Uh, but this is a mural that is in Los Angeles on Sunset Boulevard. It went up um, just after the protests, after following George Floyd's murder uh, in May 2020. And there were a series, of, well, a lot of artists kind of who uh, reacted to that moment and put up street art around the city. And we used uh, drones to capture and photogrammetry some of these um, murals. And what's amazing about that to me is that street art is meant to be kind of ephemeral. It's not meant to live on forever, uh, but it was such an important moment in time and such a, a uniquely kind of, um, you know, some of these spaces in LA are really unique. So to be able to keep those projects up in the virtual way um, to live on in perpetuity, I thought was a really important and interesting use of AR. We worked with the LA Times on this piece and uh, it's web AR, so it should just, you know, kind of pop up and, and launch. You don't need any special equipment to kind of see that. And you're also able to see a lot more detail, I think, than even if you're just looking, you know, walking down the street at it. So that was a really, um, really fun project. And I'll leave it up for like one second so uh, folks can get it. But obviously, it's on the recording. And I'm happy to send a link in there as well. Um, and then I think there's so that's sort of like the web AR piece. And then I think there's that combination of AR and social media. How does this kind of play with the platforms that we're all on? So uh, obviously, with Instagram is probably Instagram and Snapchat um, are probably the two 
uh, that folks are most familiar with. I think the T New York Times has done a really great job of incorporating some of those filter examples. The one on the left is about pollution, and you can choose kind of your city and see in your space in AR, the pollution dots around you, kind of how polluted your air is. Uh, the one in the middle is an example um, around the women's suffrage movement where they scanned uh, kind of old historic, uh, like an umbrella, I think there's a pin in there as well. And you could pose and take a selfie with these, these old artifacts. So I thought that was a really fun way to celebrate that. It was for the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote in the US. Uh, and then on the right was one that we built at Yahoo. That one is web AR, but it's meant to be shared in a social way. And that one uh, was right as the pandemic started, you know, what does six feet look like? And so we had an artist come in and create this uh, six foot long, <laughs> when you launched it, a uh, little graphic that says, keep this space safe. And you could put that in your space. That's my my cat uh, who's <laughs> six feet away from me there. So um and that was just one where, you know, what are ways to use this that people can feel like they're engaged and wanting to share it with their friends and feeling like immersive is a communal space as well as, you know, kind of by yourself in the headset. Um, and then what's next, right? So you have kind of this idea of mixed reality where the headsets get smaller or maybe non-existent eventually. We're doing work in that space. Uh, the piece on the left is from the Royal Shakespeare Company when uh, the Magic Leap first launched, where uh, it was a, a piece from Hamlet where they they launched it at South by Southwest, and you were able to kind of be in the headset, but also kind of experience the actors. Um, and then just this past week, where uh, you know Meta announced their Quest Pro, and obviously it's right now a very expensive proposition, but I think when things change, they change in the workplace first. And if we're really able to do virtual production and collaboration um, at that high level, eventually that will trickle down into changing the way that, that we work on a day-to-day -day basis. So just being aware, I think is really important um, and understanding how folks are, are experimenting with this, even if it's not something that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Most of us probably aren't, no matter where in the world we are. But it's, it's important to be reading those articles and keeping up and understanding um, what's happening there. Um, so why should you think about immersive for your newsroom? I think uh, really a couple of things. One is engaging readers so that they can consume more content. Um, I think innovation, you know, other industries invest in innovation at a high level in order to build audience, build consumers. Think about automotive or fashion, all these places. And you know, obviously we don't have the budgets and news to do that kind of thing, but I do think that we have the opportunity to think about what on a small scale would that look like for news and how do we get our readers more engaged and more excited and having, frankly, like more fun looking at stories. Um, creating opportunities for sponsored content and advertisers, they're moving in this direction much more quickly than us. So I think keeping up with that space is really important. And then, like I said, just helping your producers stay on top of new technology and preparing for the future. So we've talked a little bit about costs and I'm not gonna go through this whole thing, but I think we've talked a little about how do you use 3D assets that are open source to build into your team uh, using the phone that you already have to produce some content in this space. Then that next one, next mid range, I think podcasts and audio, um, Tulanana was talking about radio being such a huge piece uh, for their audience. And I think that that is only gonna get bigger. I think when we have spatial audio opportunities kind of supercharging the radio audience that you know is already there is really an interesting way to go. Um, hiring 3D artists to build the original 3D objects, um, you know, can be done at a pretty cost effective way at this point. Um, and then building out immersive uh, content like filters on Snapchat and Instagram. Um, Spark AR has a great blog. You kind of go in there and start to experiment um, in ways that are, are pretty low cost. And then like we've talked about, those really narrative long form VR things that, you know, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but, uh, you know, are really interesting to look at. And it's interesting to see what people are doing and experimenting in that space. And what can you learn from that to do um, at a level that's more reasonable for your organization. And then I think one of the biggest things is how do we uh, create guidelines for explaining immersive to readers? Um, there's a few things that I learned from my experience at Yahoo. And one is um, providing context. Why are you doing it in this way? Why are you telling a story using this technology? The second is like not being afraid to make a tutorial. I think one of my favorite things in the Oculus is that first thing when you put, if you put the headset on, 
there's like a robot that's teaching you how to do everything. And it's really kind of fun. It's like a little game. And I think creating those tutorials, introducing the audience to what they're about to see, what they're about to experience is important to remember. Um, not using technical descriptors. I don't think our audience really cares about these words, metaverse, XR, AR, VR. It's like, see it in 3D or engage with, you know, we did one that was like a ghost. It was like, find your ghost. Like nobody cares if it's called AR, but they care that they're able to get the experience that you're providing to them. So really moving away from technical um, descriptions. And then being creative, just trying language that conveys something new and not alienating your audience. And that's it. So uh, thank you so much. Yay, absolutely. I'm really, 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 really excited. I feel almost as if the conversation and everything else is constantly elevated. Um, and by everybody's presentation that you brought, each and every single one of you, um, Princely, Tulanana, um, Laura, Kunle have brought nuance, intentionality, perspective, and personally for me, excitement. I wish that the engagement with the metaverse and stories about the metaverse were anchored in some of what you guys are sharing rather than just the commercial activity and is it gonna be successful? Because I think this has been one of the really important things of opening our minds to what co-creation, immersive experience, and also from what I like, I enjoy historical perspective, the journey of us getting all the way from there to here, because I think it kind of makes us realize that even though things may feel a bit different, some of these things have happened before and there are lessons in the past actions and investments um, in order that we can learn and maybe help us find grounding and, and build trust in some of these platforms and new spaces. Um, we do have a few minutes. I know somebody snuck in a, an important question in there about just a repository and, and how do you host a lot of these um, immersive experiences and, and things like that. Um, this um, CTIF and Jamfest, there, there are many more sessions. There are going to be other panels and others sharing so much. Um, on this particular question especially, I think data is, is a big thing. And the more you have, um, you're moving from audio to, to, to visual to immersive technology, the more you'd have to invest in audio and other things. But um, I think that definitely have to look at joint projects for collaboration. Um, there's a Mali Magic project that Google did with um, some research institutions that is a repository of scrolls, um, recordings, and music that celebrates Mali. For those who may not be familiar, Mali is an African country, um, and they, they, because of um, conflict and war, some of the historical scroll um, um, data was being destroyed um, and terrorized, but then they were able to have a repository of some of those in partnership with archival units and organizations. Um, so for those of you that are news outlets and others, look for partnerships, look for institutions, um, archival spaces that can maybe help offset the cost of data. Um, there are some organizations, um, Amazon, Google, um, other projects. Uh, I know Laura's mentioned a few of them with Yahoo and others that may be looking at collaboration on how to also store um, um, some of these things. And that way, your organization is not the sole um, investor and, and saving some or keeping them. I see that the team has sent a coming up, so I would wrap into it. Thank you so much for each of you as speakers for joining. This has been phenomenal. Um, we're definitely in, inviting you to engage with each of the individual speakers on, on, on social media. There's a next session starting up now. Please keep up to date with Jam Lab Africa by subscribing to the newsletter. Um, I know that it's been an amazing time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you from myself, Emmanuel Gamal, and the Jam Lab Aqua team. Thank you so much and keep well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you this was great. Thank you so much. Uh, have a wonderful week, everyone. Hi. Thank you. Uh, apologies for my voice. <laughs> but thanks for being amazing support. Great voice. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure.